While beer was the beverage of choice for the common Englishman, with the rise of technology, the commoner began to drink gin instead of beer. Gin had come from the Netherlands, where it had been called Geneva brandy, and gin was made from juniper berries that were thought to be medicinal, and drinking gin for its health effects killed many Londoners from 1720 to 1751, and they'd begun drinking gin in earnest because the water had become deadly with cholera. The cholera had first come from India, brought in on the ships of the British East India Company, and it took from two to two hours to five days for the cholera microbes to take hold, and its victims would become so dehydrated that they would turn blue, so it was called the Blue Death. It would not be until 1850 that John Snow would remove the handle of the water pump in the public square at Soho to prove that water transmission, rather than air miasma, was the mechanism by which cholera was spread. It would take another generation for that phenomenon to become known, since the authorities considered such a reality distasteful and actively worked to suppress the discovery that water tainted with sewage was how the cholera bacteria disseminated into murderous epidemics. Although the British East India Company was governing the largest population of the world in India, a tiny bacterium in the water could bring them to their knees, killing tens of thousands at a time, emerging wherever the trading ships carried the cholera. In India, people became more susceptible to illness as they were displaced from their rural farms to work on plantations or in factories, and although filtering water through their silk saris and spreading the silk cloth in the sun had been a cheap and effective means of stopping the spread of cholera, adding a shot of alcohol to the water also killed the bacteria. While the beer and ale being made in England was at most 15% alcohol and was comparable to wine, the gin being made in Holland topped out at 50%, and because the English had been in constant competition with the Dutch for supremacy of trade in the Seven Seas, when the English brought over William of Orange from Holland in 1688 to put an end to the Anglo-Dutch wars, the result was that the London slums were flooded with the importation of gin from Holland, and with the drinking of gin, steadily London became more lawless. The Mohawk outbreaks of a generation back, isolated and prankish, were as nothing compared to the forays of determined ruffians, the systematic invasions of thieves and robbers, the drunken crimes of starving and homeless men. They wholly overawed the constables and the police who slunk by them warrants in pocket. In any clash of arms it was the desperados who won. More often than not the constables hugged the warmth of beer-houses, or, when it seemed urgent to make some arrests, arrested innocent people. The very constabular, constabulary indeed were as lawless when drunk as the men they were hired to, as the men they were hired to hunt down. Even when sober they indulged in petty thefts and any possible form of blackmail. Kings and Desperate Men, Life in Eighteenth Century England by Louis Cronenberger, New York Vintage Books, Alfred A. Knopf, Inc., and Random House, Inc., 1942, page 93. The poverty of the working class inspired Tom Paine to write books, and Paine was Irish and madder than hell that Catholics were treated like dirt in England, thanks to Henry VIII. When George Four became king in 1820, he kept Britain as aristocratic as possible, and watchmen were replaced by policemen in 1829, and that was the year the English discovered that beer and gin contained the same sort of alcohol. The Women's Temperance Union started up in 1874 and took aim at the drunken Irish as well as drunken factory workers where people were laboring indoors for a change rather than having to fortify themselves with alcohol against the cold. But the temperance was mainly concerned with the plague of poverty and not necessarily with abandoning alcohol altogether. The Crown didn't bother to encourage the temperance crusaders because taxing alcohol and selling licenses was dependable revenue, while religious people thought the temperance movement was 
instituting a secular crusade for divine matters. The teetotalers had an aspiring social message hinting at their superior status by pointing to the lives of people below them, and people would take the pledge, not out of religious belief but to improve their standing in society. The teetotalers were usually drinkers who saw themselves as above the poor people they wanted to help, and they came from the upper classes and had no idea how the lower classes lived. The temperance movement in England was not about helping the poor drunken folk, but about explaining poverty as something that resulted from people spending too much of their money on alcohol, not because they were being paid low wages, but because they didn't have the fortitude to stay within a budget. Temperance was not about alcohol so much as it was about the cultivation of virtue and good manners and a drunk person at one of their temperance meetings was unthinkable. The 18th century suddenly thought it had found a panacea for all its economic evils in the creation of the workhouse. Anyone in need who refused to enter one forfeited his right to relief, and the community could wash his hands of him. For all that, many refused to enter. Workhouse living was harsh and workhouse management corrupt, while vermin and jail fever were almost as common in the London workhouses as in the London jails. Kings and Desperate Men, page 245 and 6. Because of the horror of London prisons, the English started shipping prisoners across the Atlantic Ocean to Georgia. The penal code had been shocking at the beginning of the century, and as the century advanced it grew worse, and the penal code was not only harsh, it was absurd. When the nineteenth century dawned, stealing a sheep or horse was still a crime punishable by death. So was taking linen from a bleaching ground. So was cutting down trees in a garden. So was picking a pocket for anything above a shilling. So was breaking the border of a fish pond so the fish could escape. On the other hand, if a man attempted his father's life, it was only a misdemeanor. Again, to steal fruit already gathered was punishable by death, but to gather fruit and then steal it was only a trespass. To break into a house at 5 p.m. in winter was a capital offense, but to break into a house at 5 a.m. in summer was not. However much England might pride itself on its form of government, its penal code was the most vicious and sanguinary in Europe. Kings and Desperate Men, page 247 and 8. Fortunately in England, the disease was partly its own cure. The laws were too severe for juries to be willing to enforce them. Rather than send men to their deaths for trifling offenses, jurors, in the full sight of their guilt, acquitted them. The trial, in any case, seldom lasted long. One day at most was the general custom. The law could not be burdened with the cost of a long trial, and jurors could not be bored with the annoyance of it. They ate in the jury box and drank and got drunk. Drunk or sober, they fell asleep and often woke up to be talked by their fellows into any sort of verdict. A very, a few very bad laws were, however, repealed. Prisoners who refused to plead could no longer be pressed to death, and women who murdered their husbands were at length sent to the gallows instead of to the stake. Kings and Desperate Men, page 248 and 9. It was no wonder that so many English prisoners had been willing to accept tra transportation to the colonies as punishment for their poverty, and it was also no accident that the thirteen colonies had begun to form seven years after the Brit British East India Company was granted its first charter in 1600. Most of the colonies began as joint stock or corporate ventures, and they'd learned from British East India executives how to prepare for the common defense as early as 1640, while the Democrats continued to think it best to be governed by a king who would allow them to vote for figurehead governors, who would also not require that they govern themselves. The problem for Americans, falling outside the British colonial model, 
was that so many disparate factions were being allowed to vote in elections in America, including not including not only the rich and the poor, the merchants and the farmers, the Catholics and the Protestants, but also the Scotch and the Irish and the Germans and the Russians and the Swedes, that the American colonies were not so easy to govern as other British colonies that had a more heterogeneous population. The War of American Independence became inevitable because the Republicans insisted on equality and freedom, and Americans especially enjoyed gathering in taverns, where politics was always the topic of the day. Over in England, less than 1% of the population were allowed to vote, while the majority of Americans were eligible to cast a ballot, and they not only elected their governors, but also elected the local judges, and they also voted while serving on juries, and the vibrant American courts enjoyed keeping the legal professionals well employed. The senior members of the British East India Company had been practicing voting behind closed doors for many years, and they learned from experience that 13 was the magic number for a functioning board with its quorum call of nine seats. The first board of the BIC had a nine-member board requiring six members for a quorum and four votes to initiate action, so the first British East India Company flag had nine stripes. But when they were given their first charter by Queen Elizabeth in 1600, they expanded the board to 13 seats in order to comply with English corporate law, and the flag was updated to show 13 stripes. The American flag would be taken from that of the British East India Company, with the British Canton replaced by stars representing the separate states of the Union, and the number of stripes reflected the number of states required to optimize the fairness of what the BEIC had accomplished with the success of their business, and the Union ruled, the union ruled by a voting body rather than being given directives from a monarchical overlord. When the British East India had begun with a nine-member board, a quorum call meant that enough officers needed to show up to vote so that a two-thirds majority voting aye could not be overturned if those not present for the vote were asked to place their ballots of no alongside the no's from the initial vote and that total would not be enough to overturn by two-thirds the original eyes, which just so happened to be a total of four persons. The original stamp or seal of the BEIC had been a heart surrounding the letters EIC, with the number four planted in the cleft of the heart as if it were a flag or standard, and the original flag had nine stripes representing the nine members of the board. The design of the flag of the United States was meant to show that America was self-governing the same as the British East India Company, who were independent before the Crimean War put an end to their prosperity, and the Americans had believed that a bond with the British East India Company in a shared desire to oppose crown taxes would help win the war of American independence, especially because the BIC had its own private army that was twice the size of the army of King George. In response to the Americans colluding with the British East India Company, the Crown passed the Regulating Act of 1773 that put a three-member commission above the board of the East India Company to force them to resume payment of the yearly £400,000 due the British Crown that the East India Company was claiming they could no longer afford due to the Americans refusing to buy their tea. The colonists were buying Dutch tea instead, cheaper because it was less heavily taxed, and the BEIC asked the Crown if they could bypass England altogether, so to keep the BEIC from making an alliance with the American colonists, the Crown passed the Tea Act on the 10th of May in 1773. The Tea Act brought up all the 
bought up all the oversupply of tea being stored in BIC warehouses that the Americans were refusing to buy. And the following month, the Regulating Act prevented the BIC from being able to make any trade deals with the Americans. The Crown flooded the colonies with the tea from the BIC warehouses at a price so low that the Americans would be enticed to buy from King George, and that was supposed to put all the other tea importers out of business. But the patriots stuck to their boycott of British tea, and the colonists dumped the cheap British tea into the harbor on the 16th of December in 1773. The following year, Twelve of the thirteen colonies met at Carpenter's Hall in Philadelphia for the First Continental Congress. After the British had blockaded the sea lane so American fishing boats were forced to stay in harbor, and at the First Continental Congress the colonists drew up a petition to the king to redress their grievances, but the message was delayed in transmission, as messages often are, and the petition blamed the king's governors for mismanagement rather than the king himself. The second article in the petition required that all ships importing Africans into America be banned, and when the crown responded inadequately to the Americans' clumsy demands, the Second Continental Congress convened on the 10th of May in 1775 to declare war on Britain, and this time Georgia showed up, because by then it had turned into a shooting war. The Declaration of Independence passed the Continental Congress on the 4th of July in 1776, and all 13 colonies were required to sign off on the establishment of the Constitution of the United States. And after its founding, the Senate would require the same two-thirds majority as had been shown to ensure success by the board of the British East India Company, whose flag they were proud to emulate. As the thirteen American colonies had grown and begun to engage in trade, they not only followed the advice of their friends and associates within the British East India Company, but had striven for the same freedom and independence of the BEIC, and in so doing, the colonists had become Republicans and established the same number of governors needed by the states to function in their Continental Congress, readily adopting and proudly flying the new national flag associated with the BEIC. Early on, the United States was divided with the country folk who governed themselves, on the one hand, versus the city people who were attracted to the royal court and its courtesans, although all Americans were impressed by a good, well-run business enterprise, because before FDR came along with his New Deal, there was no such thing as a free lunch. To make up for the loss of the American colonies, the Crown doubled the tax on alcohol in England, and by the 19th century, alcohol production had become one of the largest businesses in England and provided 10% of the jobs. Shopkeepers would step out for a pint of beer several times a day, and everyone used the yeast from the breweries to bake their bread, and one-third of the government's, government's revenue came from taxing alcohol. The Crown relied on alcohol to entice young men to join the military, since military life was so awful that only someone under the influence would sign up, and the British stayed in the practice of flogging their soldiers and sailors right up until the Great War. Many soldiers were stationed in drinking houses as an alternative to keeping them in private homes, and the British Navy would continue to hand out a rum ration that would not be abolished until 1970. And whatever men's purpose in coming together, drink would keep them there. Never before or since has upper-class England drunk so hard. It was almost obligatory to be a two- or three-bottle man at any single session. The inconspicuous Methuan Treaty with Portugal in 1703 began an era in England English history which has yet to be, has yet to end. It signified circulate the port on a giant scale. Under Anne, port put clary, claret and burgundy in the shade. Kings and Desperate Men, page 61. The Methwen Treaty was also called the Port Wine Treaty, 
and it was signed two days after Christmas in 1703, allowing Portuguese wine into England with a lower tax than French wines. The Romans had called the country of Portugal Portus Cale, and its ancient name was Lusitania, and the city of Oporto was named after the rich red wine that blessed Portugal, and their popularity, and the popularity of their port wine, made the name Portugal stick. Portugal was 350 miles long along the western coast of Spain, and it was 70 miles wide, with the onshore sea breezes calming the hot climate of Spain so that snow fell in the northern Portuguese mountains while the rest of the country enjoyed abundant rainfall, nurturing an abundance of vegetation in an ideal climate. The Portuguese had been the first to sail away in search of other Christians to help them fight Islamic invaders, and Vasco da Gama had sailed from Portugal to China in 1498 by going east around the end of Africa, and the wealth that Portugal would amass in selling port to the English gave them enough leeway that they no longer had to work very hard at ocean voyaging in search of further fortune. While the rest of the world forged ahead with the industrial age, Portugal remained quiet and lovely, concentrating on becoming the best hostelriers in the world. In the entire word, world. Hostelriers in the entire world. While the English were enjoying themselves drinking port wine, the Frenchman Rousseau was writing about the natural man, prompting the French to stop wearing powdered wigs, and the French began wearing hairstyles and clothing that was more plain. Rousseau and his friends came up with the idea that God expressed himself in the concept of nature, and they knew that God was not interested in the wealth of the divinely appointed nobility. These romantic thinkers created the phrase, consent of the governed, when they heard stories about American Indians and the natural spirit of American Indians would inspire the French Revolution and force the British to put the plug in the jug long enough to defeat Napoleon. The French thought that the American Indians were children of nature, and so they wrote romantically about them, thinking that Indians were living in freedom and equality, and for the Romantics every person was ascribed by the Creator with certain natural inalienable rights, and Jefferson would use these French ideas when writing the American Declaration of Independence. The pilgrims had sailed west in 1620 to find a more pure environment in which to worship their creator, and the pilgrims signed the Mayflower Compact while they were still on board the ship, giving them both the benefits and the curses of self-government. In 1639, the Reverend Hooker, doing the best he could at the time, wrote the first American Constitution, and his pilgrims held town meetings where they would vote to decide what to do, and to vote required belonging to a certain religion, and having a certain amount of money, and religious freedom meant it didn't matter what church you belonged to, as long as you belonged to some church, and an honest, God-fearing one. Most Americans remained poor country folk with little foreign trade, and they bartered instead of using money, and clothes or shoes would be sold for a bottle of whiskey. But the more they used it for trade, the cheaper the whiskey got, and when Congress finally taxed corn liquor, people could not afford the tax, so they would have a whiskey rebellion in 1791. Hamilton had been the first one to suggest the whiskey tax, and had told Washington to use the military to enforce it against American civilians, and 13,000 troops were sent to crack down on a handful of moonshiners who had burned down the tax collector's house, and the whiskey makers said they'd go ahead and pay the tax if the government wanted to make such a fuss. Robert E. Lee's father led the troops to stop the Whiskey Rebellion, and nobody was injured, so no harm was done, and the militia sat down with the moonshiners to sample the product, and Hamilton had a group of the farmers arrested just to make it look good. Hamilton brought them back to Philadelphia and marched them down the center of town, wearing signs that said, Insurgent, 
and two were convicted of treason, but George Washington immediately pardoned them, and everyone went home happy. The whiskey tax was stopped in 1802 as soon as the Revolutionary War debt was paid, and alcohol would not be taxed again until it was started up once more to pay for the Civil War. Washington had used his own distillery, and 1798 had been Washington's most profitable year after he was able to retire from public life and was free to stay home, distilling alcohol, and one of the things George Washington gave the country was a great beer recipe. 